Monkey here at UTSA with Royal Retai, and today we're with Cadet Bryce Crane, and we're going to be going over aerosol school. Yep, we'll be going over the ins and outs, the training aspect, and uh, what to expect when you get the opportunity to go. Awesome, so let's get into it. All right, so what is aerosol school? So aerosol school is a 10-day course in the Army designed to train soldiers for insertion, evacuation, and missions pertaining to using multifunctional vehicles and attack helicopters. So is it only helicopters then? Uh, for the most part, yes. Okay, and what helicopters do y'all use then? Uh, the main ones are UH-60 Blackhawks. Okay. Those are the ones that you use for the insertion type missions for rappelling down into the battlefield. Uh, they also pertain to using UH-47s, which is the Chinooks. Um, those will be used for like carrying cargo because you're in charge of making sure that the cargo net and all that is safely equipped underneath the helicopter. All right, so where did you go to air assault school and what was the in-processing like? So I attended air assault school in Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, now that is now closed, so the main one is in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, in-processing, you start at day zero. Uh, you wake up real early, get there at like four in the morning. Uh, they line you up in formation with all your gear. You make sure you have all your paperwork and stuff like that. And um, then they just start to smoke you immediately when you get there, right at four o'clock when it starts. Uh, they bring you in the building, continue to smoke you, turn in your paperwork, and you leave outside and form back up and wait for everyone to finish. Then after that, they take you down to a, a big PT field where they smoke you for another 45 minutes and kind of degrade you. So when does the obstacle course come along? Because I heard that that's where uh, the highest nutrition rate comes from is during the obstacle course. Correct. So after your smoking session, after in-processing out on that field, then you go into a two-mile run and you have to complete that within 18 minutes or less. And then once you finish that, they smoke you for another 30 minutes and then you go up to the obstacle course, and that's where basically the day begins. By that time, day breaks uh, around 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that's where we kind of get most of the dropouts from, or the, the attrition rate. About 50% of people are, are done through after the obstacle course. Um, so where most people have a problem is actually climbing the road. So that's a, that's a good thing to kind of train for if you're going to be able to go, is make sure that you can efficiently climb a road. And deal with getting smoked? And deal with having your body hurt all the time. All right, so after day zero, what happens uh, after that? So basically after the obstacle course, you just go into the classroom where you just sit for another five hours and they just start beginning the coursework. So not only is aerosol extremely physical and demanding, but you also be, need to be able to think on your toes and always be mentally ready because they're going to be throwing so much information at you and then test you within the next couple hours or even the next day. And then what are y'all testing on there? Because I'm, I'm guessing it has to pertain to what the helicopters do, like their capabilities, and then the equipment y'all are loading up onto the helicopters. Correct, so it's broken up into three phases. So the first phase is basically like getting to know the equipment so you kind of learn about the helicopters that you would use uh, in these kind of missions. Uh, the second phase you'll learn about sling loads, so that's about attaching the equipment to the helicopters to be able to safely transport them to another area. And then the third phase is the repelling phase. So that's where you learn how to correctly and safely repel off of the helicopter. So the, the first day, right after the obstacle course, you begin learning about the helicopters and the equipment to use. So basically like what helicopters would you use and um, the type of equipment can, that can go under each helicopter and the amount of weight that each one can hold. Okay, and so how long are the phases then? Are they like one every three days? Or how does that work? Uh, it kind of depends. Um, usually, for the most part, it's three days for every phase. Uh, sometimes some, some people get another time to retest because you always get another chance to retest. So you get two tries every test. So maybe that next day you're still trying to retest that first phase while everyone else is moving on. So it's always important to be able to retain the information and stay ahead of the game so you're not lacking when everyone else is in the next phase and you're still kind of struggling behind. Okay, and what tips would you get for someone who is looking to go into air assault? Should they buy study cars online? Should they start looking at the manuals for those helicopters? Or what should they do? So from what I learned, um, what I was told was that each course is different and how they teach things and what they want you to learn. So I, I wouldn't go ahead and get any cards or anything like that because if you get cards about it and you're like studying all this information and then you get there and you're like, well, I, I learned all this information and we're not using it. So don't get yourself confused. It's not extremely hard. The information is super easy. It's just mostly memorization. Um, so I wouldn't confuse yourself by going in there knowing, thinking you know everything. Because, you know, if things vary here and there. Maybe a number is off on your STEM cards from what they're teaching you. And that'll, that'll throw you off. So I would wait till you get there. 
Um, just make sure you can think on your toes and um, know, know how you best study for memorization, because that's most of what it is. All right, and did y'all get a day off about aerosol schools? I know some aerosol schools allow that, and other ones are 10 days all the way straight through. So actually, we got Sunday off. So I went Monday, August 5th of 2019 is when the course started. I finished Friday on August 16th, so it was about 11 days. However, on Sunday, you do get a day off. And uh, you finish, sometimes if you're lucky, you get to finish early on that Saturday before, so you have kind of half your Saturday evening and then all of Sunday. But usually other people that were there, uh, your Sunday is used for mostly resting back up and studying. There was no time to like go out and do something, you know. No, no like, so that went to Arizona School, right? So right. no part of like exploring the town or exploring all that. You were there to focus and to get the job done. Right. I mean, you definitely have the opportunity. It's your free time. Uh, you can go explore around and stuff like that, but you need to know you're here to complete a mission and do a job. So I used it just to kind of study and get ready because the next phase after that Sunday is when sling loads start. Okay. And that's the final phase, right? No, that's the second phase. Okay. The second. So that's probably the hardest phase throughout the whole course is memorizing the, the sling loads and the safety, the safety behind it. All right. So I've heard aerosols infamous for the ruck marches. Can you tell me about that? Correct. So there's two ruck marches that happen. The first one happens on the very first Wednesday of the week. So you come in on a Monday. Uh, Wednesday is when you do your first ruck march, and that's six miles. So that's day two then? Correct. Yeah, that'd be day two. Day two. And then, so is there a time limit for that ruck march? And is there like a weight limit too? How does that work? Right. So the weight limit is 35 pounds Army standard, but with all the stuff that you had packed in there from your packing list, it honestly feels a lot more. And then you have your Kevlar. You have your full water canteens, and then you have your dummy rifle that they give you. So all together, I would say it weighed between 50 and 55 pounds for everything. Uh, the time limit is also standard for Army, so 15 minutes per mile. So you have to complete it in 90 minutes or less. Okay. And then uh, are there rules for the rifle? Because I've heard there's different rules. Like you can't, if you're walking, you can't have the rifle in one hand. You have to carry it in two hands. Was that ever applied to you all or no? Yes. So that was a really big thing that they kept watching out for. Um, if you were running or like shuffle shuffle running with your ruck, you were able to have your rifle in your right hand, but you had to hold it kind of on the barrel yeah. right before the, the, the sight, the carry handle. Mm -hmm. You had to hold it in between the barrel and the carry handle. And you would just kind of run like that. Mm -hmm. If you were walking or anything like that, you had to have it Two secured hands. in both hands, correct. Um, then on the last day, the day before graduation on Thursday, you did your 12 miles. Right. Same, every same rule apply, um, the weight limit, the way you, you know, handle your weapon, uh, all your gear is secured, um, time limit's the same, so this one would be in three hours or less. That would, that's probably the hardest part about the entire course, if you make it through the obstacle course. Um, this obstacle course is one part where everyone drops, uh, that's where they kind of weed everybody out at the beginning. And then, after that, it's not too physical, they do smoke you in the morning, so you do PT, there is a four mile run that first Saturday, or the only Saturday of the course. Um, so after that, um, it's just all learning. Most of it's not physical anymore. Again, they do PT, they do smoking in the mornings here and there. Mostly it's just them throwing out all that information and you regurgitating it when they test you. So in between there, you'll be fine, but you are sleep deprived, you are super tired. You get done around six, then you gotta go home and study, or at least they assume you're gonna do that. Um, always meet in the morning at 4 a.m., no later, you're out. Um, so by the time Friday comes around for that 12 miler, you're extremely yeah, exhausted, tired, your, exhausted. Body, your body is dead, yeah, I'll be up. for sure. But um, they do give you, I mean, you're like one step away from getting the wings. So it's always keeping you pushing. Another thing that kind of got people a lot was they do sensitivity checks at least three times a day. Uh, what is a sensitivity check? So they checked to make sure you have your sensitive items. Okay. And there were three important sensitive items you always had to have. They gave you a piece of paper or a memorandum that kind of stated that you were supposed to be at the course. You had to have your CAC card on you at all times. And you, at least one canteen had to be filled. Mm -hmm. And the way they checked that is they would put you in formation and fall in. And they would take your canteen and shake it. And if they get in your air bubbles, you were, the no questions asked immediately just dropped. There was one instance where a cadet forgot his cat card in the in the barracks of the dorm area and within five minutes he was driving home. Wow. And then right before the ruck on the last day, uh, another soldier didn't didn't fill his canteens all the way so when they shook it, 
no questions asked. Ask them to politely stand up, take his equipment, and move to the side, and they out process him out before we even started the run at like four or two in the morning. So that they're really serious about your sensitive items. And then the last big thing, on top of all that, is the packing list. Mm -hmm. So they give you a very specific packing list, and they check that the first day you get there, after the six miler, and then after the 12 miler. And it can get really hard to keep up with because it's a lot of little items. And especially after rucking for 12 miles in under three hours and you're dead tired, you could drop a pen or a Sharpie that they ask you to have on the packing list. Then when they check it, if it's not there, they just ask you to get up and leave. So that, that was a very mentally stressful was the packing list and all the information they threw at you. So that was kind of the hardest part for me was just the mental aspect. And so finally, you made it to graduation and completed the 12 miler. What's graduation like? Uh, graduation, right after the, the 12 miler, they kind of run through you what's going to happen. They give you a hit time. So we finished around 6 in the morning for that, for that run. Um, got to go back, got to shower, kind of rest up a little bit. Then you come back and form up in front of the Phantom Warrior Hall on Fort Hood. And then they just kind of show us how we're going to stand in formation. Uh, basically, like a little rehearsal pretty much. Yes, yeah, pretty much. You kind of walk out onto the field, and the bleachers are in front of you, so all your family and friends and uh, Kendrick can come and see you. And you just stand at parade rest the entire time as they go through their little their speeches, the Pledge of Allegiance, the Army song. Then they had the Phantom Warrior song they had us learn. I had to repeat that every day. The Soldier's Creed, and then they just go through like distinguished graduates, the person who finished the, the 12 mile the fastest. And then they have a demonstration of like repelling out of a helicopter so everyone can see what oh, yeah, what awesome. we learned at the very yeah. end. And then after that, you're dismissed and you go home. You go home with your wings. Well, new badge. That's what's That's up. That's right. All right. So how is air assault used in current operations today? Uh, so most of the time, air assault now is used for transporta transporting the equipment. Excuse me. Uh, so carrying sling loads and stuff like that under the helicopter. If you were out with the unit in the field or on base some, they're going to look for you like, hey, you know how to make sure this is going to be safely transported so it doesn't unhook and, and fall. Mm -hmm. um, it could also be used in the soft community as in like inserting or evacuating um, soldiers, anything like that. Um, but yeah, it's mostly, mostly in like regular army use for trans transporting equipment. All right, awesome. And so by you having your aerosol badge, how does that make you stand out? compared to other soldiers who don't? Uh, people are going to look for you, your NCOs, your officers, uh, anybody above you uh, are going to look at you to kind of set the standard. And then those below you are going to look for you to set the example. So they're going to be looking at you on how to act um, in a tight situation, like if you needed something transported mm -hmm. or uh, any type of those, those soft missions. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to look for you to be able to know what to do. And if you needed to like kind of help other people, teach other people that. Um, it also sets you apart because it may not be as renowned as Airborne, but it is, they do look at you and they're like, wow, like, I know, I've heard about that, that's really, oh, really, really, really tough school. That's yeah. really tough, he made it through, so he's someone that we can rely and depend on. Exactly. So. All right, awesome. Well, y'all, thanks for joining us. Always remember, birds up, come and take it, and this will defend.